um, also had cabbage, multiple stents. Not really sure about the timing of that, but he said it was a long time ago. He did have a recent left heart cath about a week ago, which showed patent stents. Going to social and family history, smokes about two packs of cigarette daily for about 50 years. Currently, he's down to one to 1.5 packs a day. Um, alcohol only uses occasionally. No recreational drug use. Um, he's a retired person, worked as a logger, um, and then became a truck driver before he retired. Family history, again, non contributory siblings with like abdominal aortic aneurysm and father had hypertension. Home medications. Uh, so cardiac wise, takes aspirin, Plavix, Carvedilol, Felodipine, and isosorbite mononitrate, also renolazine and nitro. Um, and he's on a torvastatin. Diabetes, he takes glimepiride. And then he's on buspirone, gabapentin, cymbalta, and colcrix. Buspirone recently started for um, more so for anxiety that they thought he had. Um, allergies, no known allergies to drugs. So just moving on to labs, uh, basic workup initially, WBC a little bit elevated at 13.2. His hemoglobin was 13.8, um, dropped to just 11.1. Uh, platelet whites also, he has a history of thrombocytopenia, but he did drop to 106. And then he had an MCV of 94.6. Um, going to the other basic labs like CMP, again, overall, okay with a little bit of elevated potassium from 5 to 5.9 creatinine of 2.3 to 2.08 that he, he that's his baseline um so nothing there and then some transaminitis which again kind of trended down he was noted to have a lactic acid of 3.2 uh when he came in and his troponins which were checked because of his uh, complaints of chest pain remained negative so, um, of course, you know, at the outside hospital, because he came in with complaints of chest pain and abdominal pain, they did further work up for him. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys can see it clearly on the slides, but it was a non-contrast CT because of his kidney disease. They didn't want to give him contrast, but you can still see like some lesions there. It's like numerous of them. Um, so it was read as uh, you know, numerous to count hepatic lesions. He was also noted to have adrenal bilateral, bilateral adrenal nodularity. I wasn't able to get a good picture without the non-contrast CT. Then moving to further findings, he was also noted to have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which was noted to be around four centimeter. In the past, it has been three centimeters uh, per the patient. And then also some lesions in his kidneys, uh, which they said that it were more like cystic. Again, this was all based on non-contrast studies. Um, and while they did the chia CT abdomen pelvis over there, they, of course, we got the lower part of the lung and this is how his lungs looked. So again, multiple nodules all over the place, at, at least the basal part. And again, red as central lobular nodularities and reticulation. Um, so of course, so given this was a non-contrast CT, we got our own imaging here with contrast. Um, so starting with CTA abdomen pelvis, and I think you can see the see it clearly here that he's got multiple lesions in his spleen and then multiple lesions in his liver. So again, just numerous to count lesions everywhere in liver and spleen. Then right here, of course, you catch the part of the liver and the spleen, but you also see these areas right there with stranding, especially this side. This is the adrenal glands, and the stranding around is also the hemorrhage. So, and the CT that we did here was only a day after the CT that was done at the outside hospital. And so this was, of course, read as bilateral adrenal hemorrhage that is new from his previous CT a day before with uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage, uh, and also it showed the abdominal aortic aneurysm. CT chest here uh, with contrast, as you can see, again, multiple small nodules everywhere. You also see lymphadenopathy here, necrotic. So that's how it was read here in the hospital. <laughs> 
So based on the images we got, we got a little bit further workup uh, because of his adrenal hemorrhages, we got random cortisol. It was around close to 9 p.m. Uh, reference ranges, you know, early in the morning around 6 is 10 to 20 and around 4 p.m. is 3 to 10. And one hour after you sleep, it's around 5. So, I mean, he wasn't bad. Um, TSH was fine. Lipase a little bit elevated at first and then trended down to normal. Um, HIV negative, hepatitis panel was noted to be negative. Um, AFB, we did it, three sputum cultures were negative, um, AFB staining. And then we also did an MTB PCR, which was noted to be negative. And then iron panel, again, ferritin just a little bit high at 599, but um, nothing uh, you know, concerning there. And then we just did a CT head to rule out anything else, and that was also negative. So just a brief summary so far, uh, you know, he's a 69-year-old Caucasian guy with history of coronary artery disease, tobacco use, coming in with chest pain, abdominal pain, some dyspnea or exertion, fever, night sweats, weight loss. Um, the workup so far just showed numerous nodules everywhere in liver, spleen, um, lungs, also bilateral adrenal nodules subsequently became adrenal hemorrhage and then retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Um, cardiac workup wise, he just had a cath, which was negative. So overall labs didn't really reveal much. Um, again, AFB, HIV, MTB, PCR, they were all negative. So for the next portion of the presentation, I would like to introduce Dr. Sandeep Bhargava. He's gonna be discussing this case further. Um, Dr. Bhargava completed his medical school at JNMCH at AMU in India. He did his residency and chief residency at Chicago Medical School, Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago. He has been working as a hospitalist at Emory at St. Joseph's Hospital for the past five years, and his clinical interest is in sepsis. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandeep Bhargava. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desai, uh, for presenting the case. Uh, uh, so very interesting case uh, we have got here. Uh, and I'm going to go over uh, 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 different uh, aspects of it. And today's quest uh, would be from problem construct to coming down to my top differentials and uh, to suggest for the investigation and potential pitfalls. So our problem is, is a 69-year-old male uh, with history of AAA thrombocytopenia, coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, presented with abdominal chest pain, fever, night sweat, weight loss, chronic productive cough with black streak, dyspnea on exertion, nausea and vomiting. Uh, going over uh, history of uh, present illness, uh, we see that uh, I'm gonna go over the pertinent positive things that stand out on my review was abdominal pain, which uh, is going on for a week, right, uh, initially right upper quadrant, then left upper quadrant and diffuse. And it, it is worse with eating um, and chest pain, which is again, worse with activity and after eating. A review of system uh, was positive for fever, type B symptoms, fever, night sweats, weight loss, um, possible melina, chron chronic productive cough, dyspnea on exertion, chest pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Pertinent negative findings was no sick context, no recent travel, and no hemoptysis. Past medical and surgical history, things that st stood out is uh, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, which, is, which poses immunosuppression in patients, coronary artery disease, CKD, again, uh, can cause some degree of immunosuppression, triple A, and a recent left heart catheterization, which showed patent stents. Uh, he's a smoker with 100 pack year logger, uh, by uh, profession and a truck driver. Uh, he, family history is significant for AAA and L, home medication, all cardiac medication with dual antiplatelet agents. Uh, on physical examination, things uh, uh, that were negative were no lymphadenopathy noted and diffuse tenderness in the abdomen with the worst in left upper quadrant. Uh, so just knowing these things on history and physical, what am I thinking right now is uh, a guy uh, with history of triple A, CAD, diabetes, hypertension, who smokes, comes with abdominal pain, chest pain. I don't want to miss out on anything that can kill him. So uh, my first uh, thought process is, is this aortic pathology? Is there aortic aneurysm leak, aortic dissection? Uh, 
uh, or acute coronary syndrome, though recently he had a cardiac uh, catheterization, which was negative. So that's pretty much uh, rules out. Uh, however, we'll get EKG and troponin, as we always do in medicine, when somebody comes with chest pain. So, uh, and then other thing that stood out was relation to food. Uh, the pain gets worse, is it esophagitis, is it gastritis? And in relation to food, there's weight loss as well. So is it, could it be chronic mesentric ischemia or something like that going on? Uh, so there are other things that we have to pay attention to, which stood out were type B symptoms, fever, night sweat, waist loss, and then he has cough. So that puts uh, several other uh, disease on our radar, which are leukemia, uh, lymphoma, and uh, malignancy infection, autoimmune, uh, and TB, fungal lung disease, and HIV. Uh, there are other set of symptoms, melina, nausea, vomiting, are we missing bowel ischemia, peptic ulcer disease. Uh, also interestingly, uh, uh, abdominal pain, fever, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, uh, could be subtle findings in adrenal insufficiency, though we need more data to support it based on labs. So based in medicine, we love to uh, come up with one diagnosis uh, to explain everything. Where, uh, so it's called Occam's razor, but uh, in reality, some, there's Hickam's dictum where there could be as many diseases as the patient may please. So I cannot explain everything based on one diagnosis. So there are many things. Is it vascular? Is it GI? Is it infection? So we need more information. So let's get to our quest. EKG, non-specific. Uh, some pulmonary pattern, uh, right axis deviation, nothing stands out. On lab, patient had leukocytosis when he came and over next uh, couple of days or, or over serial laboratory investigation, hemoglobin trended down, platelet trended down, uh, patient became hyponatremic from high, uh, nor, uh, normal sodium level and became hyperkalemic. There was creatinine was elevated uh, it came down. I don't know what the baseline is, so it could be AKI or CKD. AST was elevated and lactic acidosis persisted. So in CT abdomen, the things that st stood out, Dr. Desai already mentioned, bibacillar pulmonary reticular opacity, AAA, and hepatic lesion, bilateral adrenal nodularity. Uh, what I would like to know in bilateral adrenal nodularity is uh, uh, how big are these nodules? Is there what is the lipid content? It, if it helps us determine whether this is um, uh, high lipid means more adenoma, less lipid means it could be metastatic. Uh, <clears throat> subsequent labs ruled out uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency, cortical, random cortisol level in the evening is uh, normal or higher than normal. HIV, uh, interesting thing that was uh, HIV is negative and AFV is negative. Uh, which broke my heart because I was thinking this is TB and AFB is negative and MTBR, uh, MTB PCR is negative. Uh, ferritin is high, which could be because of chronic uh, 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 inflammation. So uh, repeat CT with contrast uh, did show bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, which tracked down to retroperitoneal spaces, again, in neural uh, liver and splenic hypodensity and random nodularity on CD chest and extensive necrotic hyalur lymphadenopathy. So let's go over the findings that stand out on this is one lactic acidosis, necrotic hyalur lymph node, miliary pattern of lung nodule, splenic lesion, liver nodules, adrenal nodules, and adrenal hemorrhage, increasing potassium and decreasing sodium. TB testing is negative, so should we just quit? TB in our diagnosis uh, and black sputum which I must say, this was my first thing that I looked up. What is the cause of black sputum? So we'll, we'll go over these things. Lactic acidosis, as we know, it could be type 8 or type B. Type A is due to hypoperfusion and hypoxia seen in shock state uh, or regional ischemia, mesentric ischemia. Whereas type B is inability of uh, mitochondria to uh, process pyruvate, so it activates alternate pathways and uh, the common causes is we may see it in uh, alcohol intoxication, DKA, but we all, uh, as well as most commonly uh, known thing uh, is metformin, or rather I should say most popular is metformin induced uh, met uh, lactic acidosis in 
CKD or insulin disease. Uh, but the other things that stand out is malignancy and liver disease. They can cause lactic acidosis. Oh, something happened there. So uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, necrotic lymph nodes, uh, the causes for uh, necrotic lymph nodes could be infection, inflammatory or malignant condition. Uh, the left ones were systemic, so it's not showing up properly. We can live without it. The most important thing was a mediastinal, uh, which our patient had hyalur lymphadenopathy. Uh, common things that uh, could be causing necrosis is metastasis, uh, which could be lung, esophageal, stomach, pancreas, testes, or breast uh, or colon cancer, as well as tuberculosis. Uh, then we see miliary pattern of nodules and TB. The miliary pattern in, of nodules happen be, either because lymphangitic spread or hematogenous spread. So if it's a lymphangitic spread of a disease, it could be carcinomatosis, sarcoidosis, silicosis. Whereas if it's hematogenous spread, uh, think about infection, TB versus non-tubercular uh, infection like fungal infection, histoblasto, cochidiomycosis. Uh, other than that, malignancy can also uh, cause these patterns, uh, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and lung cancer, uh, lung adenocarcinoma. So there were uh, a lot of splenic hypodensity. There are many causes for splenic hypodensities, uh, which are parasitic cysts, neoplastic cysts, false cysts, true cysts, uh, trauma. Uh, then there are causes like splenic abscess, which can cause uh, uh, hypodensities, uh, which are which could be staph, strep, Escherichia, Salmonella, fungal, and TB. Uh, we also see a metastasis, uh, cancer going over uh, to spleen. So these things spread hematogeneously to uh, spleen. Uh, so think about anything spreading by blood if it's going to spleen. Uh, a note: metas generally the cancer when they go to uh, spleen, they are generally at the end stage. So breast, lung, ovarian, colorectal, cancer, uh, gastric, melanoma. And melanoma involvement is the most aggressive involvement in spleen. So something to keep in mind. What about liver lesion? There are multiple small lesions, uh, which could be anything from benign to malignant. Uh, some of the uh, them are being listed. Uh, we don't want to miss out uh, any infection. So the infections could be kinococcus and Tamiba histolytica, disseminated TB and malignancy. The primary malignancy tend to be bigger, less number, and metastasis tend to be smaller size, multiple. So as in our patient, uh, adenocar metastasis could be common cancer, adenocarcinomas and melanomas. This uh, pictorial representation is for uh, metastatic pattern in adenocarcinoma. And if you uh, see the orange, does this work? Okay, if you see uh, this orange is liver. So these are the can cancer and their predisposition to uh, met metastasis to liver. You see all these GI tract cancer, colon, esophagus, uh, rectum, stomach, pancreas, uh, they have a predisposition to go to liver. So think about those. Coming to adrenal nodules, uh, most common adrenal nodule is adenoma. Second most common is metastasis, but there are many other uh, causes like pseudosis, hemangioma, pheochromocytoma. Um, adrenal nodules, uh, uh, adrenal glands can uh, get metastasis from lung, breast, melanoma, and others. Uh, 50, a point to note, 50% of melanoma metastasizes to adrenal gland, and these are subclinical. Uh, uh, findings. Uh, so adrenal hemorrhage, uh, adrenal hemorrhage is uncommon. Bilateral adrenal hemorrhage is really rare. So our patient did have bilateral adrenal hemorrhage. Uh, adrenal hemorrhage can happen in trauma, in any stress. So adrenal gland has a very interesting blood supply. It has a good arterial supply, but it's uh, vein, it has one vein and very few venules. So if there's stress, a lot of blood goes into adrenal gland, but it has nowhere to go. So it pools and then it bleeds. So uh, any of the stresses can cause, sepsis can cause uh, hem uh, adrenal hemorrhage, uh, coagulopathy or uh, hemorrhagic diastasis like BIC, antiphospholipid syndrome, anticoagulation hit, or thromboembolic disease can do. Uh, 
Adrenal tumors uh, can do it. Pheochromocytoma is the most common cause of adrenal hemorrhage among adrenal tumor and metastasis. And just a point, uh, most common endocrine involvement in TB is adrenal gland. I'll try to look up if TB causes adrenal hemorrhage too. I could not find um, any case report on that. Uh, diagnostic testing for tuberculosis. So this, I was really hoping AFB would be positive, MTB, PCR would be uh, positive, or at least MTB, PCR would be positive in setting of AFB negative, and it was negative. So, so let's see what is the sensitivity and uh, of these tests. So sputum AFB stain, uh, it has high specificity. If, there's, there, if it's positive, it's likely, but it has variable sensitivity, 20 to 80%. There's, uh, if you take two consecutive sam sputum sample, it identifies 95 to 98% of smear positive TB patients. Our gold standard for uh, TB diagnosis is culture, but it's time consuming. Uh, it takes four to eight weeks. Uh, Latest, we use MTB PCR nucleic acid amplification technique, and that's what we use here in our hospital to uh, uh, expert MTB. Uh, so, uh, the interesting thing about it is, if based on um, a literature, uh, based on some studies on uh, patients who already had positive, who already had diagnosis of TB, they ran this test. So, uh, M smear positive, culture positive. Uh, uh, patient, uh, TB positive patient, the sensitivity is 98%. Well, they, we know it would be high. So it has a high predictive, uh, positive predictive value. Whereas smear negative and culture positive uh, TB patient sensitivity drops down. For If you do it for the first time, it's only 72%. You do it, repeat it again, it goes up by 12.5%. You repeat it 3%, it goes up by 5% more to 90%. So in our patient, smear negative, and uh, MTB PCR negative, we are technically leaving 28% of patients behind. So, but if it's positive, it's highly specific. And uh, so, what about the black streaks in sputum? So, it is called melanoptosis. It can happen in pollution, uh, coal worker pneumoconiosis, but it can also happen in tuberculosis, anaerobic infection, ischemic necrosis, and bronchopulmonary. Melanoma as well as aspergillus infection. So coming to my top diagnosis based on what we know, things that have stood out in parallel it has been infection, likely TB, miliary TB, disseminated TB, or malignancy, maybe melanoma or other kind of malignancy. Uh, we we know with uh, tuberculosis, uh, if the uh, since it's one of the uh, one of my f top choices, uh, miliary, uh, and why I say that is um, miliary TB can affect any bo body organ. Most common is liver, lung, spleen, and then uh, adrenal at fourth or fifth. So in p patients who are in endemic areas, if you think about these constitutional symptoms, like in third world countries, this TB is always the first uh, uh, a differential diagnosis. Melanoma, uh, you know, malignancy is also a significant uh, 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 di a differential diagnosis. Uh, we would need some kind of biopsy to uh, rule that out or rule that in. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, the sodium is going down, uh, going down, potassium is going down. I don't know what were the subsequent vitals, what were the glucose level uh, subsequently, uh, but Think about adrenal insufficiency or developing adrenal crisis in patients who have bilateral hemorrhage. It takes 90% of gland to uh, be lost before these things uh, set in motion. But if those things set in motion, the mortality rate is high. So suggestion for further investigation, let's go back to history and ask about exposure to TB, uh, physical examination, look for suspicious moles. Uh, Invest, uh, investigation wise, uh, uh, I just threw blood culture, sputum culture, uh, fasting cortisol, ACTA, just in, with respect to developing possible adrenal insufficiency in a setting of uh, uh, adrenal hemorrhage. And then, uh, you know, we need to uh, 
uh, rule, uh, we have to make a diagnosis about whether it's TB or not. So what are the other things that we, tools we have? We have TST, tuberculin skin test, but with miliary TB, there's significant energy. So these tests may not be positive. Uh, and then other tests like T-spot or uh, repeat PCR MTB, which I showed increases the chances of identifying. Uh, one of the things uh, with miliary TB is putum culture uh, has a cumulative yield of 41%. So you'll miss out a lot on those. So liver biopsy, around 88%. And uh, if you do lymph node biopsy, that has the highest sensitivity, uh, 90%. Bronchial alveolar lavage is also somewhere in 60%. So uh, you know, if I have to pick one, if uh, uh, pulmonologists can go in and do uh, a biopsy of the necrotic tissue, maybe that may give us diagnosis. One thing, uh, I'm still stuck to GI symptoms. I cannot explain uh, a relation of abdominal pain uh, to food. We know miliar TB can cause abdominal pain. Liver, spleen involvement can cause abdominal pain, as well as patient has uh, chest pain when he eats. So maybe there's some gastritis going on, PPR trial, EGD, uh, maybe. And this. Uh, so the potential diagnostic pitfall, if you think it's TB, don't leave it at one diagnosis. Keep try to keep finding alternate ways to diagnose it. Just uh, and call ID or pulmonary, and uh, there could always be uh, more than one process going on. So keep an eye open for that. Thank you so much. That's my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bargoa, for that wonderful presentation. Um, like Dr. Bargoa said, you know, call either ID or infectious, dis I mean, uh, pulmonary, and that's what we did. Um, so the next person I would like to introduce is Dr. Jay Warki. Dr. Jay Warki received his BA from Marquette University and MD degree from Medical College of Wisconsin. He completed his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in infectious disease at Duke Medical Center. He joined Emory University in 2009 as the Director of Antimicrobial Management Program and Associate Hospital Epidemiologist at Emory University Hospital. He currently serves on numerous institutional committees and leads in many areas of quality improvement. I'd like to welcome Dr. Warkey on stage. Great, thanks uh, Dr. Desai for the introduction and to Dr. Bargava for teeing this up. Um, so some of what I'm gonna show is gonna seem like repetitive. That's intentional for two reasons. One, I wanna highlight a couple salient points and two, kind of highlight where similar information may have a different impact from my view as a consultant. So from my perspective, I had the pleasure of meeting this patient on uh, day five of his hospitalization. And in terms of setting that up, by that point, this patient had had three, I think a fourth sputum was obtained that day that were all AFB smear negative. We were waiting for an MTB PCR. And one of the things I always appreciate as a consultant is having a very specific question. So in this case, the question was very clear. Evaluate suspected miliary TB in somebody whose initial sputums are smear negative. So rather than, than uh, repeat the history and exam that's been presented, um, I do want to highlight a couple points. And one of them is kind of interesting. One is the idea that you know when you have different folks within the medical system ask the same question, sometimes you get different answers and how that may actually impact your thought process. So from my perspective, um, although this patient um, had, had reported to my colleagues a history of fevers and night sweats, he gave me a somewhat different story. He actually denied fevers, but gave one very clear episode of drenching night sweats approximately two weeks prior to presenting for medical care. Um, as uh, Dr. Desai mentioned, I thought his social history was interesting as a retired logger. Um, of note, during when he transitioned then to truck driving, I asked him in terms of whether he uh, did cross-country trips and where exactly his, his uh, work was. Most of his, in fact, all of his truck driving was limited to the southeastern United States, which was helpful to me from an epidemiologic standpoint. His family history, family history is always kind of curious from an ID standpoint. And I usually ask about a couple different things. I ask about recurrent staph aureus or recurrent history of boils. I ask about um, uh, autoimmune diseases, just given the fact that it's often the differential of what I see as an ID physician. And I ask about TB. When I asked about TB, his answer was kind of interesting. He said, you know, my mother uh, was diagnosed with TB or as a TB carrier. Uh, which raised all sorts of questions. So when I dug into it a little bit more, 
Um, it was when he was a child, so it was approximately 50 years prior to his admission. And he did actually recall her taking a medicine from the health department for nearly a year, but didn't remember her being sequestered or sick enough to be in the hospitalization and doesn't remember any other family members who were told that they were contagious. I extrapolated from that, but didn't want to assume, but extrapolated that it was likely that she was diagnosed with latent tuberculosis. Um, his vital signs, and again, it was just one point in time, but notable that even with this reported history of fever, or maybe reported history of fever, throughout his hospitalization, he actually was afebrile um, up until the time when I saw him. And other than what's been reported previously, the only other notable finding I thought of note was that he was chronically ill-appearing, but uh, not acutely ill-appearing and was not cachectic. Um, we've seen lots of different aspects of images. I picked these two cuts, even though we looked at some, just because I wanted to highlight one, the fact of just on the mediastinal windows, these necrotic lymph nodes, which were just in just subcarinal, um, which um, I'll show the full differential on the chest CT from radiology. But I think given the broad differential, differential of miliary lesions, the presence of necrotic lymph nodes that's been presented earlier um, put the onus in terms of at least ruling out uh, active miliary tuberculosis. And again, you can appreciate just the diffuse um, I'll say random nature of the nodules that were seen. I say that only because again, as I dug into this, and again, this is what I've learned as an ID doc, talking and reading some of the pulmonary literature and the radiology literature, the pattern of what's seen can actually help direct the differential. And of note, on the initial chest CT, I think maybe from the outside hospital, there was a mention of the nodules being central lobular. Of note, when our folks looked at it, they actually described the pattern as random. Why is that helpful? Um, Again, this is directly extrapolated from our radiology report. You notice the fact that because they commented specifically on the randomness of the nodularity, um, that favored actually thinking about miliary TB, or as Dr. Bargava said, other processes that can spread hematogenously, including malignancy. Um, and again, we've seen several pictures of the CT abdomen and pelvis, where again, the differentials seem to come down between disseminated atypical and infection, uh, specifically TB versus sarcoid versus metastatic disease. So you've seen a couple different ways in terms of different, how differentials are organized. And if, <laughs> for any of you who, who have consulted on, you'll see that I often start with the approach in terms of thinking about infectious versus non-infectious etiologies. And that's mostly to talk my way in terms of trying to be complete. Um, so again, we'll, we'll zoom in and, uh, in terms of the, the infectious etiologies, but in terms of not to lose uh, sight of the other non-infectious causes, you know, I tend to tell my trainees that if you tend to think about neoplastic and autoimmune, that often covers the gamut. And occasionally we see patients where it's us, the rheumatologist and the dermatologist all looking at each other, trying to figure out what the most re uh, logical way is to, to make a diagnosis. Um, but again, as an ID doc, if I'm looking at somebody, one of the ways I can see myself to try and be useful to a primary team, in this case, hospital medicine, is to try and adequately rule out infectious etiologies. Um, again, if you look at the differential in a textbook, it's broad. But as you hone in, we really could limit it in terms of the most common causes, which really, again, just to, to reinforce the teaching point, really come down to mycobacterium tuberculosis, endemic fungi, and less often cryptococcus. Um, this is one of the points I highlighted because it, it was a learning experience for me in terms of thinking about what the radiologists were seeing and seeing how that might direct this patient's workup. Again, we talked about patterns of micronodularity and again, recognizing that some of these nodules, specifically kind of this millet seed pattern, can be central lobular, can be perilymphatic, and can be random. Um, in terms of how that correlates clinically, um, I thought it was interesting. So again, if you start with this large differential, the fact that these uh, nodules themselves appeared random with no defined distribution really suggested that this was hematogenously spread and whether that could either really be infection or cancer. So if you look again at our broad differential, in my mind, I was leaning more towards, again, adequately ruling out most common infectious etiologies, in this case, TB or endemic fungi, and also keeping in mind hematogenous metastasis, which as Dr. Bhargava said, we're really focusing on vascular tumors in this case. So melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, thyroid cancer, and less often lung, ad lung adenocarcinoma. Um, I realize it's very on brand for an ID physician to talk about thinking about thinking, but um, this is what we do. Some specialists say that's all we do. Uh, but, but I did find this interesting. And again, it's, it's, um, 
kind of a nice sort of step back in terms of, again, being complete and trying to avoid biases. So I found this uh, kind of nice summary paper from colleagues at UIB interesting talking about dual process theory. It's this notion that when you think about a diagnosis, almost every clinician uses one of two approaches or all, more often a combination. So one is intuitive. And this is the idea of thinking about pattern recognition, previous knowledge or experience. And again, most using that approach is often quick. It doesn't really require a lot of cognitive effort. And then there's the analytical approach. So again, this is more often used for complex, challenging cases like this patient. Um, and I like to lump that in terms of what is the diagnosis I don't want to miss. Um, it's slower, it's deliberate, intentionally so. Um, it uses significant effort. And again, there's some folks who, again, are much more scholars in education theory than I could even try to, that even try and say that when you think about it, there's a gradation with experience. In other words, most trainees will be taught to follow an analytical, more complete approach with experience um, and uh, with, with better clinical ability in terms of rec recognizing patterns, but knowing that there, that comes the risk of bias. Um, you'll see senior physicians maybe follow an intuitive approach. The important aspect that I learned from this is really one approach is not superior to the other. And there's aspects where actually both complement each other. And a good example of this, I think um, I'll, I'll pick a common ID example and one that's relevant to this patient. So if you think about a young person presenting with thrush, recognizing that that should trigger to think about HIV risk factors and testing for HIV and someone who isn't screened is again an intuitive approach. It's pattern recognition. On the other hand, if you take somebody, take that same patient who happens to be HIV positive and untreated, who then presents with fever, lymphadenopathy, diffuse pulmonary nodules, there's a huge differential with that. And again, it's incumbent on the clinician to be complete and do follow a very analytical complete pattern to actually get to the underlying diagnosis. Um, in this case, the diagnosis I didn't want to miss was miliary tuberculosis. Um, but what I thought they had was hematogenous metastatic cancer. And in terms of stepwise, it was incumbent on us, and I think in terms of thinking about how to get to diagnosis, to adequately rule out miliary TB first. Um, so how do we do that? Um, in terms of recognizing what comes first, I wanted to, again, just make sure that we didn't forget about disseminated fungi. And again, there's a long list of endemic fungi, but recognizing that this patient's travel had been limited to the Southeast United States, I thought the most common uh, endemic fungi that could fit this pattern would be histo, and specifically acute disseminate, excuse me, acute diffuse pulmonary histo. Um, again, this would have made more sense if he was actively logging or trucking and had a huge inoculum and got sick, which again, this person having been retired, thinking about reactivation of latent disease, which we see with fungus, seemed less likely, but again, we wanted to be complete. Um, fungal culture, when it comes to diagnosis, is notoriously slow and can take up, uh, up to four to six weeks to grow histo. Uh, antigen is much faster, and you can augment your sensitivity by testing both serum and urine. In this case, urine came back first and was non-detected. My suspicion, suspicion wasn't particularly high, so that was helpful. Um, Cryptococcus, again, is common. Um, it's ubiquitous, really, in all soil, especially in areas around birds, specifically pigeons and chickens. Um, a miliary pattern with this kind of imaging is actually quite unusual, um, although, again, there's reports of it. Uh, in this case, a serum cryptococcal antigen was obtained and was negative. Um, so then let's talk about miliary tuberculosis, because, again, this was sort of the elephant in the room and recognize this patient has been in uh, airborne precautions now on, air, uh, on day six, which, um, as those of you who care for patients can be vexing to both patient, family, as well as staff. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine, so you'll forgive me to use a minute to get on it. But this question of, you know, with the AFBs being negative times four, does that rule out miliary TB? And the answer is absolutely not. Nor does it actually rule out pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, again, we have large epi data. We also have local data here at Emory. So again, if you look uh, nationally, um, not nationally, actually internationally, and if you look at miliary TB, sputum uh, smear positivity is only present in about 35% of patients with miliary TB. If you look among our patients with confirmed tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis at this hospital going back a decade, we have within infection control longitudinal data that show that 50 to 70% of those patients were smear negative. So getting smear negative samples does not rule out active TB. And getting to Dr. Bagrava's point, then you're relying on culture. Problem is culture can take a while. And even though the micro lab will hold AFB cultures for four to six weeks, with tuberculosis, samples generally grow within two to three weeks. So it's usually that 14 to 21 day window. 
So what can we do to expedite it? And this is what we were waiting on the first day I came in was the gene expert um, MTBR uh, uh, rifampin assay. So again, this is a molecular assay. It's been endorsed by the WHO, approved by the FDA. Uh, Colleen Kraft, uh, uh, Dr. Kraft, who is the medical director of the micro lab, uh, brought this uh, assay into the clinical micro lab about two years ago. And again, I asked her that I wanted to be able to test not just AFB positive samples, like Dr. Bargava mentioned, but also test those that are negative. And the idea there was to increase sensitivity to help more expeditiously rule out people who may have active pulmonary tuberculosis. In this case, um, how much does it give you? Well, uh, we, we've looked at this before. It identifies 55 to 72% of smear negative culture positive TB, which doesn't sound great, but recognize the fact that those patients without this assay, we'd be waiting two to three weeks to ultimately diagnose by culture. So I find this assay very helpful. And, and what I've been using to try and actually expedite getting people out of airborne precautions and to more efficiently rule out TB. So this I just pulled and this is, I'll, I'll conclude here. This was actually extrapolated from my, my um, uh, uh, impression and plan, um, my second day of seeing this patient. And I'll just kind of get to the punch is that I agree that AFB, uh, biliary TB has not been completely ruled up, but the presence of negative AFB smears, a negative MTB PCR, and again, my history that was a little bit different in the sense of no real fevers and only one isolated set of night sweats made, in my opinion, biliary TB less likely. Um, and that being said, uh, I've been burned enough in terms of by uh, having cultures grow on day two to or, uh, week two to three where I did recommend continuing airborne precautions. Uh, but my thought was that this diagnosis would be most likely made by tissue. And just given the location of those necrotic subcranial lymph nodes, I thought that those might be amenable for, uh, for uh, biopsy via bronchoscopy. Uh, so pleasure and thanks for uh, letting me participate in this patient. Thank you, Dr. Warkey, for that wonderful presentation and your expert opinion. Now, I would like to introduce um, our pulmonary interventional pulmonologist, Dr. David Berkowitz. He obtained his medical degree from University of Texas Medical School in San Antonio, Texas. He completed his residency at Howard Medical School and completed a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Emory University School of Medicine and dedicated interventional pulmonary fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Berkowitz began practicing at Emory in 2009. He is a principal investigator on multiple clinical research projects. His clinical interests are in diagnosing and staging of lung cancer, airway and endoscopic management of lung cancer and complications of treatment, bronchoscopy, critical care medicine, interventional pulmonology, bronchial thermoplasty, and lung disease. I'd like to welcome Dr. Berkowitz here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Desai, for that introduction. Um, when I was a fellow here, I did my pulmonary fellowship here at Emory, I had a chief fellow who told me, if you couldn't tell me everything, if you couldn't tell me about a patient in 10 minutes, then he didn't need to know about it. So I'm going to try to honor his legacy and get through the history pretty quickly here. Um, again, do, like Dr. Varkey had mentioned, um, when we come in approaching a patient as a consultant, it's a very focused question to answer. But even in that situation, there's a lot of overlap between the questions we're going to ask, the information that's already been obtained. And as you'll see, uh, when we get to a diagnosis here, even in these situations, when there's a lot of overlap between the consultants and the history, there may be a piece of information that's key to the case that might be left out. So some of the things that are important um, from um, our evaluation from a pulmonary perspective, the number one thing that we were worried about is this gentleman's weight loss. When you talk to him, he had a 100 pound weight loss and it varied over um, a time period, but suffice it to say it was within the last six months or so, this gentleman had unintentionally lost about 100 pounds. Um, he also had noted a lot of dyspnea on exertion, progressive over the last couple months as well. It started out when he was climbing stairs, but then he noticed it on flat ground. Um, and then the other thing that was very pertinent and that really raised eyebrows, is, as um, everyone has discussed about before, some of his uh, pulmonary symptoms with the night sweats, which uh, when he had uh, described in Tuss had been ongoing for about three weeks. Um, and also had the, the cough with that sputum production that had some of that black material in it. 
Um, the other things that were pertinent into our, um, um, our review was that, uh, as Dr. Varkey had mentioned, that his mother had been um, treated for tuberculosis, whether it was active or latent TB as a child. Um, she was treated for a year, his potential occupational exposures as a, as a former logger, and the fact that he was a very ded dedicated smoker. Um, we discussed some of his imaging, and we're going to look, um, focus mainly on the, the uh, chest imaging here in just a second. Um, so breaking down the chest imaging, when we approach a patient with abnormal uh, CT of the chest, we divide it into um, um, the lymph nodes, so the mediastinal views, and then the, um, the lung windows or the lung tissue itself. Lymph nodes are typically about a centimeter or less in size, and as you can see, all of his lymph nodes at multiple stations were about three times as large. Um, and then again, looking at the pulmonary parenchyma, as we have uh, previously mentioned, he had numerous um, tiny nodules in a, in a random pattern, um, which uh, was used um, or has been described as a, as a Miller A pattern, which um, had um, introduced the possibilities, as we had mentioned, about infection and, and metastases. Um, no effusion was noted, and there was uh, no evidence of metastatic disease, at least in the bone windows. Um, so again, to reiterate the point, when you see a millary pattern on a CT scan, that really narrows down the thought process. And, and, and this, the millary pattern itself has a very specific definition to describe these randomly distributed um, innumerable pulmonary nodules, which are very small, usually measuring one to four millimeters in size um, throughout the lungs. And these are some of the representative images. Again, when we look at CT scan, we look at the mediastinal windows and also lung windows. These are cuts from the lung windows. Um, so some of the things uh, to point out is um, those are some, a couple good examples of the, the tiny little uh, millary nodules. But he also had these larger nodules in the right middle lobe. These were in the one to one and a half centimeter range and um, looked a little bit different than, than the, uh, the millary nodules and, and raises the possibility of either a conglomerate of nodules, so the same process appearing a little bit different or two different processes. Um, we've discussed the differential here um, from different perspectives. The things that were highlighted um, from, from our review of the patient uh, were microbacterial infections. So not just tuberculosis, but pulmonary MAC, so um, uh, microbacterium avium. So um, something that would also uh, appear very similar, histo, which, um, and other fungal infections, which he may have been exposed to in, in his uh, career, uh, metastases, and then sarcoid. And, and sarcoid hasn't been discussed as much um, up until now, but um, a number of patients, uh, you get fooled when they present with similar symptoms uh, in, in a CT that you would uh, put your dime on it being miliary tuberculosis, and it turns out to be that pattern, but in a patient who has nodular predominant sarcoidosis. So that was one thing that we were worried about. Um, that's going to be approached a little bit differently um, in terms of making the diagnosis. And then interstitial lung diseases. So there are a number of ILD patients that present with um, nodules um, in lymphadenopathy. And the ones that come to mind were RBILD, respiratory bronchiolitis ILD, and BIP. Um, although uncommon, patients who have numerous pulmonary, small pulmonary AVMs, the nodules may not represent um, an infectious process or a soft tissue process, but may actually be a little dilated uh, vessels uh, throughout, the, throughout the lungs. And then we mentioned silicosis as well. So flipping the CT scan to the mediastinal windows, uh, we then look at the, uh, the structures in the mediastinum, which are mostly in this case, the prominent features are the lymph nodes. So you see the, there was a significant lymphadenopathy in the right and left paratracheal regions. Um, and then there's a subcarinal lymph node, um, which uh, is the lymph node sitting between the right and the left main stem bronchus when it divides. And then he actually had some hyaluronic lymphadenopathy as well. So this would be considered diffuse lymphadenopathy throughout the thorax. Um, when you blow up that first image there, you can really appreciate kind of this necrotic appearance of the lymph node. So there is a uh, soft tissue area around the outside with a central kind of um, liquefied center, in essence. 
Um, and that makes the approach a little bit challenging if you're gonna do a biopsy, because if you sample something that's completely soft tissue, you usually get a, you know, a homogeneous appearance and a good sample. But if you stick a needle into something that has a liquefied center, you may be missing out on the diagnosis here. So um, um, when we approach a, a patient who has a diffuse lymphatic lymph adenopathy, there's overlap um, with some of the diagnoses we've talked about with some of the innumerable pulmonary nodules as well. And we're thinking along the same lines that the lymph nodes could be enlarged from metastatic disease, from lymphomas and leukemia. Again, sarcoid comes up on the differential, and I can't emphasize that enough, is that there's a, a good overlap in a patient like this um, with a non-infectious, non-malignant diagnosis, and then tuberculosis as well. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean when you sample with lymph nodes, you're gonna find an AFB positive smear. The lymph nodes could be enlarged, not from lymph adenitis, but just from inflammatory component um, from the underlying process. So in patients with sepsis, if you sample a lymph node, you'd not necessarily get, make a diagnosis of the bacteria, but they may be inflamed just from, um, uh, or they may be enlarged just from the inflammatory process. Uh, we've talked about his labs here, and since we don't have a diagnosis at this point, the leading things um, can only be diagnosed with additional sampling. We proceeded with a bronchoscopy. Um, so again, because there was uh, two different, potentially two different processes occurring, one in the lung parenchyma and one in the lymph nodes, we approached this with um, planning for a biopsy to do both a TBNA um, and to do a BAL, which helps us with infection, but also a transbronchial lung biopsy of the, uh, of the nodules themselves, because some of the things on the differential in the parenchyma, you're not going to be not infectious and you can't diagnose just with the BAL. So uh, for some of you um, who um, have less familiarity with bronchoscopy, the bronchoscope is a small, thin camera. It's about the width of a pencil eraser. Um, goes through the vocal cords, usually through an endotracheal tube, but can be done under moderate sedation without, um, without a, a, an ET tube as well. And goes down into the, um, the lungs. And the appearance is like looking through a tunnel. So all the interesting things we want to see and sample are on the outside of the airway. So what we look at um, basically is, is the airways themselves. But if we want to sample for the, like the, the parenchymal lesions, you take the scope and, and advance as far as possible, wedge it into an airway, and then inject sterile saline, and then suction it back out, and collect it in a trap here, and that's um, how you sample for infection. So that's a BAL. Um, likewise, by doing a transbronchial lung biopsy, you don't actually see the nodule or the lymph node, um, well, the nodule that you're biopsying. Um, you advance the scope out as far as possible into a subsegmental airway and then advance the forceps a couple centimeters beyond that. And then using a real time x ray fluoroscopy, you open the forceps and sample it. So it's a somewhat blind process in terms of sampling. Um, parenchymal lesions. And there are some ways to improve that yield uh, through navigational bronchoscopy and endobronchial ultrasound. But for a patient like this that has diffuse lesions, those aren't going to be helpful. So this is a somewhat um, a blind approach to sampling, uh, sampling the, uh, the parenchyma. Um, this is actually the, the uh, this is an, a, a bronchoscopic image from our patient. Um, this is the main crina. So right lung, left lung, and again, all of, whoops, got a little aggressive there. Um, so all of the lesions that, um, that were interesting are sitting outside the airway, so we can't actually see them. So this big lymph node that's sitting in the right parotracheal region is right here, but we can't see it. Likewise, the subcrinal region right below um, the main carina here, we can't see the lesion. So we use an endobronchial ultrasound. So this is a different bronchoscope. So the flexible diagnostic bronchoscope is a zero degree scope. You can see straight ahead of you. An endobronchial ultrasound has an ultrasound probe at the distal end of the scope. So you have to switch out scopes in mid procedure so that you advance the scope with the ultrasound at the end and it has a needle so that you can visualize in real time um, the lymph node and then putting uh, the needle into the lymph node. So you get confirmation of, of an adequate biopsy. Um, this isn't from our patient. We did have some EBIS ultrasound images that didn't come out so great. 
Um, but in a patient with a necrotic lymph node like, um, like the one we were sampling here, the center here is going to be a little bit darker. So it's going to be more anechoic and the soft tissue kind of on the surrounding areas. So we tailor the doing the biopsy to the soft, to the soft tissue areas and hopefully not sample the necrotic areas, but nothing's perfect. And it's a three, you know, a 360 degree image, so to speak, is that you have to rotate it and back and forth. Um, and in that sphere, sometimes you end up not sampling um, tissue, but sampling the necrosis. Um, this is the that black stuff um, that everyone's been describing that he's coughing up. It doesn't project very well. This is his left upper lobe here and his left lower lobe. So it was kind of this blackish material mixed in with sputum. Um, so we did this procedure under general anesthesia. He was intubated. Um, the bronchoscope was inserted through the ET tube and we did two BALs. And the reason we do two BALs um, in patients that we're trying to rule out for tuberculosis is that we're trying to send two AFBs off so that we can either confirm the diagnosis or we can rule it out quicker. So a sputum, when you take a sputum AFB, that essentially samples all of the lungs, so the right and the left at the same time. When you do a BAL, it's a very focal AFB sample you're collecting. So if they don't have TB in the right middle lobe, that doesn't mean we sample, they couldn't have TB in the, the left lower lobe. So we usually try to sample bilaterally, and that's helpful for ruling out a patient, taking them off precautions if they're unable to produce sputum. So we did do two BALs in this case. So again, we have to switch out the scope after doing the diagnostic part of the procedure, the diagnostic bronchoscopy part of the procedure, and switch out to the EBIS because it's a different scope. Um, so we take the, the flexible scope out and we insert the EBIS and then at that point, of course, there starts to be ST depressions. And it, re Reminder, this is the guy who presented with chest pain, coronary disease, multiple, um, multiple stents. Um, so that gave us a little uh, pause here, um, to say the least. Um, nitro paste was placed and he intermittently had improvement. And when I say that is sometimes the ST depressions went away and sometimes they came back. Again, this is a telemetry, it's not a 12 lead EKG. But we got to a place that we felt it was safe to cautiously proceed. We did sample the subcranial lymph node, and even though that's probably not the one that we thought was going to be the highest yield, that's the easiest one to do in a quick situation. So we did that very quickly and um, obtained a few samples, but we couldn't go back and sample the parenchymo because it was just felt not to be safe. Fortunately, extubated, no EKG changes with the 12 lead EKG and his cardiac enzymes were negative. So there were no complications from the procedure, but you can understand in the history building up to this why there was um, obviously a lot of concern during the procedure. And it's a good reminder that even in a low risk procedure like this, in a patient who's high risk, um, you can have complications. And even in this situation, so we're sampling um, both the lymph nodes and the parenchyma, um, you're holding, you're keeping patients off uh, Plavix or off their, their antiplatelet therapies, and there could be a complication uh, very procedurally. Um, and it sounds like it's probably time for us to, to let you know what we found with the bronchoscopy. Thank you, Dr. Berkowitz, for the presentation. Um, I don't know if you can pull my slides back up. So I'm not going to go over the hospital course um, because, you know, we have already kind of seen how he progressed. The rest of the workup, including the GI, it was kind of placed on hold uh, because we needed the diagnosis on him. So just to kind of show you the pathology pictures. Okay, so this is the subcranial lymph node biopsy. Um, and then pathologists did stain it for SOX10. Um, so these are all right here, all the brown staining is the uh, melanocytes. So of course, like Dr. Pargo mentioned, we did, I did go back and talk to him, be like, hey, do you have any skin lesions or what's going on? He didn't say anything to me at, uh, when I was leaving the room. He's like, oh, doc, what about this spot on my head? And I'm like, okay. So I look at his scalp and this is what I see. And I'm like, how long have you had that for? And he said about two years. And my daughter told me to get it checked out. But I told her that, honey, I'm not going to die from this. I'm going to die from something else. And so he never went to see a doctor. 
We told him the diagnosis. He stayed overnight. Um, next day, he decided that he doesn't want any further treatment and he decided to go home with um, home hospice services. So the rest of the workup again was just left. We gave him the diagnosis and that was it. So and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, everybody. I would like to thank Dr. Warkey, Dr. Bargo, and Dr. Berkowitz for their um, help and presentations. Thank you.